Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning where we can be here on this Independence Day worshiping you. But Father, as we talk in, over the next few moments, not worshiping um, our country, but worshiping you, God, and your son is our, our savior. Father, I pray that in the moments that follow, we hear directly from you, that your spirit would speak to our hearts. And that, Father, whether this is somebody's first time walking in the doors or they've been here for 30 years, that you would speak to each of us individually, that you would, you would show us what you have for us today. So we thank you, and I do thank you for this time. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you go ahead and have a seat? So who's ready for a good old-fashioned celebration today? Anybody ready to go? You know, I, I live out in the Boston area, and last night we're sort of in the valley, and it, I heard there were fireworks going all over. It was unbelievable. I don't know. I've never been in war, and I doubt I all ever understand what war is like, but last night it sounded a little crazy. I'm, I'm not going to lie. We actually went to a friend's house, and they were doing stuff in their backyard, and I, I feared for my life. <laughs> there were a couple times where debris falling on us. I said, wow, that's pretty good. Um, but speaking of fearing for your life... Have you ever truly feared for your life? Now, I'm not talking because of an illness or a sickness. I'm talking because of a situation you found yourself in, a physical situation beyond your control where all of a sudden you said, oh, this could be it. I had one of those situations and it was in a foreign country. I was in India. And if you've ever been there, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. If you haven't, you might want to check if you ever go there. No, it's a wonderful place to go. But one of the things that first struck me about India was what happened on the roads. You see, with one, uh, however many billion people are in India, the number keeps growing and growing. The roads are really packed and between cows, literally cows all over. That's not a lie to rickshaws, to people, to motorbikes trying to get into every crevice. I, I would never ride a motorcycle there. They're just like ants all over the place all the time. And we're traveling in these small buses. It was unbelievable. I'm surprised we didn't run over everybody in our path because our driver really didn't take care for where we were going. I'm an awful passenger when I'm in the car. Anybody else hate being the passenger? And I get really nervous and anxious, but in India, it, all bets were off because this guy was flying around every corner. If there's a cow, literally a cow in the middle of the road, he'd swerve out of the way, get to the, it was unbelievable. I remember sitting there rocking in my seat in the bus saying, Jesus, this is it. It's you and me. There's nothing else. Be with Holly and the family because this is it. Seriously. It was one of those moments, and above all else, when we got out into the country roads and we're on these hills and there's cliffs, there was just nothing between the window I was looking out and straight down. And our driver thought it best to take those turns on two wheels. <laughs> he didn't believe in keeping all, he probably kept them all on the four on the ground, but it felt like we were just winging around these turns. And you know what I longed for above everything else at that moment in my life? One thing above all else. I wanted a guardrail. <laughs> Just one guardrail right here between me and certain death. And a guardrail is really an amazing invention that I wish they would know more about in India or other places in the world. It's really this strong piece of metal that protects people from certain doom of going over a cliff. Or if you're in traffic, dividing traffic, they didn't even really have those all these places and people are just flying by each other. Buses with literally hundreds of people stacked on them just going down the road like they had no concern for anything. A guardrail would have made all the difference in the world. A guardrail offers protection from falling off a cliff or from getting caught up in head-on traffic. A guardrail, and maybe it's just perceived safety and not real safety, but when you see it there, you say, oh, at least there's something to, to catch me if I go a little bit too far. A guardrail is something that in our lives, not only on the roads, can make a huge impact. You see, as followers of Christ, there are guardrails that our faith offers. 
There are things that the word tells us about in scriptures and the teachings of Jesus and Paul and throughout the scriptures that if we put these into practice in our lives, they offer guardrails. They keep us from the cliffs that may exist in our lives. Today is the 4th of July. On July 4th of 1776, or 245 years ago today, think about that, 245 years ago today, the Declaration of Independence was signed where we declared freedom from Great Britain. The 13 colonies were now free and the Revolutionary War would follow and there was bloodshed and all this going on. But at that moment, we thought as a country we were free. Free from the grip of England, free from taxation without representation, free from everything that we thought was hindering us. But you know what? Even after the war ended, we weren't truly free. We weren't truly free. And even 245 years later, we're still not free. Why? Because there's a greater evil trying to grab your attention and your heart than even Great Britain. Sin and the bondage of sin is still at work in our world and grabbing a hold of everybody it can and the guilt and shame that go along with sin are crippling people left and right. And I hope, and I'm just going to lay all my cards on the, on the table or on the music stand, if you will, right as we start. I hope that today you begin to understand true freedom. Not freedom because we live in the United States of America. Not freedom that becomes from wars or battles fought on, on many different battlefields but freedom that can only be found through Jesus. Freedom for your heart and your soul. Freedom from the grip of sin and the bondage of all that goes on in our world. Freedom from the pull of culture that wants to destroy us. And we're going to start our journey by looking at at Romans 6. So if you have your Bible or your phone or whatever you do to, to read the scripture, you can do that or it'll be up behind me. So Romans 6, 14 through 16. For sin shall not be your master. Because you are under the law, you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Shall we sin just because we can and there's grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the the one whom you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or slaves to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Paul is suggesting here that you and me and everybody were all slaves to something. Something has our heart, something has our allegiance, and we focus our attention on that thing, on that person, on that opportunity, whatever it may be. We focus all of ourselves on what that is. And some of those things will lead to to obedience and some of them will lead to death, but we're all slaves to something. So ask yourself yourself this question. What are you a slave to in your life? What gets your attention? What do you focus on? Is it things of God or is it things of the world? Do you focus on the goodness and the greatness and the majesty of who God is or do you focus on what you can do in your own wants, desires, and needs? Because as Paul said, it matters what you're obedient to. It matters at the very core of who you are. And if you want to find true freedom, you need to figure out what you're obedient to. You see, there are some here, like I said before, who have been following Jesus their entire lives. But you still may not be free. Because there's still something that's gripping your heart that, that secret sin that you don't want anybody to know about that really controls your mind and your heart. And when nobody's looking, it's your go-to. You're not truly free. Sometimes there's those sticky situations, those sticky sins that grab a hold of us that we don't really experience the new life that Paul was talking about in that verse salvation and following Jesus is so much more than getting to heaven someday. 
It's about how you live your life today and tomorrow and the next day and how you love and care for the world. Not because it's out of duty, but because your heart has been transformed and you live differently in this world. When you're not a slave to sin, all of a sudden you begin to live differently. Listen to verse 16 again. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness. If you're a slave to sin, listen to this, it will lead to death. Or are you a slave to obedience? Do do, do you follow the ways of the Lord in the scriptures? Do you read the Bible and let it penetrate your heart and sink deep into who you are and follow this? Because if you do, you are living within the guardrails of our faith and guardrails lead to true freedom. Guardrails lead to true freedom. When it says obedience leads to righteousness, righteousness is defined as acting in accord with divine or moral law. Free, listen to this. Free from guilt and sin. Have you ever been crushed by guilt? Just pretend nobody else is in the room right now. There's nobody sitting next to you. Have you ever been crushed by guilt because you did something you knew you shouldn't do? Because you, you lived in such a way that was contrary to the way God would have you and you just, you just knew everything instantly that you were crushed. Have you ever been there? I know the times in my life when I've lived in that place, it is awful. I can remember times being so crushed by the weight of the guilt and the sin in my life that I just couldn't even get out of bed. It was bad. Because you, you, you know you shouldn't have engaged in something, whatever it might be, but yet you did. And that weight is so intense. But if we live in the guardrails of our faith, we'll find true freedom. If we live in the guardrails of the way we're supposed to live our lives, that will never be your story. Because you're walking in the beauty of this relationship with Jesus. James says it so clearly in the book of James. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Listen to this next line. It's great. Just don't listen to the word. Do what it says. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Pretty bizarre. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. So as you look at the word, as you study it, as you dig into it and you look at it, you recognize that guardrails lead to true freedom when you study it and understand that this is not meant to be an oppressive, heavy book, but it's supposed to give life and freedom and you're supposed to walk in the beauty and the grace of who Jesus is. When you understand that, you experience freedom, the likes of which the world is seeking. One of my favorite things I get to do as a pastor is actually do weddings. It's really cool when you have a man and a woman standing right in front of you They don't know what they're about to get into. They have no idea. And you almost can mess with them a little bit if you want. I usually don't. Maybe a couple here and there over the years, but not usually. But as they're standing in front of you, one of the formalities of a wedding ceremony, it's not just a formality, it's actually declaring your intent to your future spouse, is called actually the declaration of intent. Many of you have said these words over time. You said them, somebody asked you, and you said, I do, and back and forth. But these are the words. Listen to this carefully. So and so, do you take this woman, or vice versa, to be your wedded wife, to live together after God's ordinance in the holiest state of matrimony, to love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health? And listen to these next two phrases. And forsaking all others, keep yourself only unto her so long as you both shall live. 
And hopefully as that is said, the guy or the, the woman says, I do. And what they're doing is they're establishing guardrails for the rest of their lives as a married couple. Especially those last two words, those last lines I highlighted, forsaking all others, keep yourself only unto her. You wouldn't believe the number of people I've had in my office over the years who have messed up those two lines. And they've come in just broken because they know they've stepped outside of the guardrails. They felt the weight of the guilt and the, the sin and it's just crushed in on them. To some people, these covenants or these commitments sound old fashioned. They sound like that's something that was for so many years ago. Why do we commit to that today? But I'll tell you what, those commitments create true freedom in a relationship, in a marriage. As a husband and wife, as a man and woman come together and they make that commitment each to the other, they're setting themselves up for a future of freedom. Of freedom. When those vows are faithfully kept, as the word encourages us strongly, encourage us to do, the number of broken homes goes down. The guilt and shame that people carry around subsides because guardrails lead to freedom in all areas of our lives. There was one time when Jesus was interacting with some teachers of the law and Pharisees. He was teaching and he had this group of people around him and it was a hostile crowd. They were trying to find ways to trap him and, and trap him into a lie or you know, being contradictory to the law. They were just trying to find a way to get at him, to get rid of him because they couldn't stand him. And on this day in particular, they thought they had the right answer. They thought they had exactly what they needed to do to trick up Jesus. So they found a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. And they brought her before Jesus and they, they dropped her right in front of Jesus, right in front of everything that was going on. Imagine what was going on in her heart. She knew the law, she knew what it said, and she knew that her days were numbered because of what was happening to her right now. It says, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such woman, women. Now, what do you say? And then it says they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. In your mind's eye, imagine the scene. This poor person, full of guilt and shame, knowing that her days were likely numbered, knowing that this could be the last few breaths she ever breathes. And then she's brought into this, in front of this most holy person who's been teaching, and there's been crowds gathering around him. She finds herself right in front of Jesus and all of these religious leaders. I imagine her heart was going to burst in her chest. But look what Jesus did. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said, if any of you is out without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. What was he doing? Well, the first thing I think he was doing is because he loved that person so much. He was pulling the attention off of her and onto himself. He was pulling it right to himself. And what was he writing in the dirt? Well, it really doesn't say. Some people thought he was writing out the the commandments. Some, Some people think he was writing out the sins of those who were gathered around. It doesn't matter what he wrote. But it matters what he did. He took the attention on himself and off of her. It's a beautiful picture. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first. They, they knew. They knew that they all had sin in their lives, that they haven't lived within the guardrails. They knew it, and they started to flee. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. And then Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? There's nobody left. It's just the two of them. She's still shaking. But but here it is. Jesus says, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She says, no one, sir. Listen, these are the most beautiful words. Then neither do I condemn you. 
Now go and leave your life of sin. He's establishing the guardrails for her. He's saying, I, I don't condemn you. I know exactly who you are. I've, I know everything about you. I know, I know, I know, and I love you, and I don't condemn you. There are times in my life when I needed to hear those words because I knew what was in here. And I needed to hear Jesus say, I don't condemn you. I love you. I care for you. But now, go and leave your life of sin. Go and live within these guardrails. And as you do, you will find freedom. You'll never be in this position again if you do it my way. Romans 6.18, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. That so, sounds so much better than being a slave to sin, is being a slave to righteousness, to doing the right thing, to following the, the law, the divine law, and then not feeling that guilt and shame because you're doing exactly what you should be doing. Guardrails lead to true freedom. On this 4th of July of 2021, maybe today's the day you say, you know what? I need to line up my mind, my heart, my actions and understand that maybe God knows better than I do. I've tried it my own way and it hasn't worked and I, I just feel that shame and that guilt. But maybe today's the day. Romans 6.22, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. As you live this way, listen, your life is different. It's not for someday, someday when, when um, in the future. It's for today. Yes, eternal life, as it says, will come, but right now it will lead to holiness and how you live, how you carry yourself, how you interact with others. And as you live in that way, the benefits are immense. As you commit to Jesus in living that way, the guardrails that are established lead to true freedom. All of a sudden, you're not trying to do it on your own, trying to make the best of life just because you think you know better. You're truly following the one who created you and listening to his words and following his lead. On this July 4th, on this Independence Day, we are celebrating freedom. We live in a country where we can even worship like this and join like this together on a Sunday or any time through the week. There's many in the world who don't have this. But this does not lead to true freedom. There's only one way. I'll never forget a few years ago, I, I had the privilege of being in the middle of Lebanon, actually on the east coast of Lebanon, close to Syria. And we were in a Syrian refugee camp. And if you want to see the, just people who are broken, whose lives have been destroyed, whose families and friends, many have been killed in front of them. It was this incredible scene. But I'll never forget sitting in this one tent, this makeshift tent on borrowed property with this gentleman who, as he was talking, he was just crying as we were drinking the strongest Turkish coffee I've ever had in my life. He's just sobbing. But do you know why he was sobbing? Not because he lost everything. Not because his home was in Syria and he was now in Lebanon living in this awful tent. Do you know why he was sobbing? Because through one of our partner ministries, he found Jesus. He realized that he was now free from the bondage of sin that had so easily and so often entangled and ensnared his life. He was now free to live and think and to actually breathe. The weight of his guilt and shame was gone. This guy was actually baptized by our partner in ministry and discipled. And I wish I knew his story today to know what he was doing or where he was. But as he accepted Jesus, he was ostracized from his entire family. They wanted nothing to do with him, but he still had tears 
because he found true freedom. He found what all of us are ultimately longing for if you haven't found it already. I'll never forget sitting with this guy. Do you ever have those moments in your life that they're just etched in there forever? My goodness. To see somebody who had nothing, literally, barely the clothes on his back, crying tears of joy because he was free. It was a beautiful picture. And that same picture can be yours and mine. That same picture, that same feeling, that same emotion can well up in our hearts as we have the same experience and we understand that guardrails lead to true freedom. As you read the scriptures and pour over them and let them sink into your heart and let them inform how you live and think and the things you do in your world, you are actually more free than you could ever imagine. The, the, the rules and what scripture lays out are actually meant to set you free. When my children were young, we had certain rules in our house. We had things they were allowed to do and things they weren't allowed to do. I hope your family has the same rules. Don't play with knives. It's a good rule for a two-year-old. Don't play with matches. It's a bad idea. Don't touch the stove. Right? Certain things. And we can look at those rules even now as parents and still know that they, they set parameters for our kids to be free and have life. And the same is true of our faith. When we walk within the guardrails of our faith, when we understand that when we're obedient to the Lord, we are righteous and we can live differently in this world, we begin to experience true freedom. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this opportunity to be here in your presence, worshiping and learning on this 4th of July of 2021. Father, I pray that you would help us to truly be free. That as we walk, as we live, as we experience whatever you have for us in this world, we would do so without guilt and shame. We would do so knowing that you're in control and we're not. And as we experience the goodness of who you are, we would embrace it and become more and more free. Lord, in all ways, in all ways, we ask that you show us the things we need to change in our lives to, to turn over to you and maybe seek, um, seek forgiveness in. Seek a new way of doing things. Seek, seek a new way of thinking and living and interacting with those around us. Lord, help us to do that. If there are things in our heart that even today we know that aren't right, Lord, help us to remove them from our lives so that we may be free. We thank you for times like this where we can gather and learn and grow together. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.